Hi folks. <clears throat> Today what I thought I would do is uh, chat with you a little bit about um, how we apply network concepts a little bit in genetics. Uh, I know in the past there's been both a little bit of confusion uh, regarding how to apply things like ideas about epistasis and gene interactions to some of the network concepts that I use. So I thought a brief uh, primer and explainer would be in order. Also I've had requests from some of my former students who are studying for medical licensing exams and uh, have been using my past uh, genetics lectures in their studying and uh, would appreciate some online explainers on this and some other topics. So I hope this is useful. So <clears throat> when we're thinking about network concepts in genetics, we're always dealing uh, with an idea that genes are interacting. And if you think about a, a traditional network graph, you're looking at uh, nodes polka dots <laughs> with edges joining them. The nodes in our case will be genes or gene products and the edges will be interaction between those genes. So today we want to kind of cover the idea of genes as nodes. Uh, what do we mean when genes function as nodes in genetic or biochemical networks? And also how do we uh, kind of connect that to biophysical or biochemical reality? We want to talk a little bit about interactions between genes as being edges and later on we'll discuss the fact that epistasis is something that you would expect interactions between genes is something that you would expect between network partners later on we'll talk a little bit about types of interactions that are seen in edges and we'll also try to make this idea of nodes a little bit more concrete i.e what has to happen in terms of biochemistry and biology for a gene to become manifest in a cell as a node in a network. So <clears throat> to begin with, I just want to introduce sort of my general paradigm, which is we have to remember that all gene, although genes are encoded forms of information in DNA, when we think about how they're functioning in cells, we need two things to happen, and that's transcription and translation. So in order for a gene to have some physical reality, if you will, in terms of the life of a cell or an organism, we've got to get that gene transcribed. So we have to see RNA accumulating and we have to have that gene product translated. We have to have its encoded protein accumulating within the cell. So here I've got a little concentration by time graph. Obviously, as you increase that indicates that the intercellular concentration of the molecule RNA or protein under consideration is increasing. But here we have this interesting line listed. And so let's talk about that just a bit. This line is the concentration required for the normal biological function that is encoded by the gene uh, to manifest within the cell. So historically in biochemistry, this has kind of been referred to as the biochemical threshold. You can also think of it as a genetic threshold. What does that mean? If RNAs accumulated a concentration below the threshold, then within the window of time that that genes encoded protein is required in the cell, um, if the RNA does not pass the threshold requirement, the gene product is not going to increase to a high enough concentration in the cell to be effective in the life of the organism. Now, conversely, if the concentration of RNA or protein passes the threshold, all is well. The cell has enough of that enzyme or enough of that transcription factor or enough of that receptor um, in order to be able to do the normal job expected for that gene in the cell. So here we're going to talk about two genes. We're going to talk about different time scales. They're going to be specific for that gene. But remember, RNA accumulates in real time. It has to accumulate in real time and pass that threshold. Then as that RNA is being translated, the protein concentration in the cell for this gene is going to slowly increase as well until eventually it passes threshold in order for that interaction or that function of the gene to occur. So let's go ahead and activate our first gene. What has to happen? Well, obviously transcription is going to occur first. 
So first the RNA transcript will accumulate. It will presumably pass threshold. That means there will be enough of that RNA present in the cell for the gene to have a normal role in its function. And then as with most molecules, eventually that RNA will begin to be degraded and its concentration will drop in time. So you usually have this window. You can think of it as the threshold uh, requirement window of the cell. As long as that coordinates with other function of the cell, um, this gene's activity should be required. Now as the RNA is accumulating in terms of its concentration, soon enough it's going to become begin to be translated and the protein for that gene will accumulate. Well, once the protein passes its threshold requirement in terms of its local concentration, nanomoles or picomoles of the protein accumulate. From a network perspective, we would say, ah, this cell has established the presence of a node. This node's activity, the function of this gene, the function of this protein, has appeared on the scene in the cell because of the transcription and translation that was required to make it. Now, since the RNA and the protein has passed threshold, whatever the job that this protein does in the cell, let's say it's a transcription factor. Well, this protein is going to begin to partition into the nucleus. It's going to bind to its target DNA and will begin to affect the transcription of its target gene. We'll say that gene 1 is required for the activity of gene 2. The gene 1's protein product is required for the activity of gene 2. Now that we're at a point in the cell's life and the organism's function where this protein is accumulated, it's doing its little job, what should we begin to see? Well, we should see this responder gene begin to respond. So in network world and also in epistasis world, we say now, now that we've built this first node, we're going to have its effect begin to have an impact on the target gene. Now, one thing you'll see here is there's an arrow drawn with an arrowhead. In network parlance, this means this is a linear dependent positive effect on whatever the target is. So we established our first node, we built a protein, the protein's doing its job. Its job is indicated by this arrow. In network speak, we would describe this as an edge. What's going to be happening now at our second gene? Well, what we would expect to be happening, if this is a transcription regulator, we would start to see a response at the other gene. Its mRNA would begin to accumulate, and similarly, we would anticipate that it would pass threshold. But now, as the protein for the target begins to accumulate, ah, we build our second node. So here, through the biochemical activity of transcription and translation, then protein function at a first gene, we have established a genetic network through the interaction of that first gene's product on a second gene and the transcription and translation of that gene. Now, if we were going to convert this into a network graph, and we'll do that in just a bit, we would have to start to think about now what have we built? Well, what we've built are two nodes in a genetic network, the protein function of gene 1 and the protein function of gene 2. We've also established an interaction. We've shown the development of an edge that shows this relationship between these two genes. One talks to two. One has an influence on two. That influence is positive, in this case linear dependent, meaning the activity of gene one is obligately required for the activity of gene two in this situation. Now, if we were going to move into a situation where we're going to say, OK, let's let's map this over to a network graph. How would this little bit of art change? Well, what would happen is we would still have the nodes and the edge that we built, but we just kind of lose the arrowhead. This is a classic subnetwork graph. Two nodes, gene one and gene two, their activity represented through their biochemical function shown in this, in this situation because the nodes are present in the graph and the edge between them 
shows um, that there is an interaction. Oftentimes in network graphs, we don't see the arrowheads that indicate epistasis. So a network graph is sometimes stripped of information about who came first in the biochemical process. We know from our little analysis of this system that red gene, gene one, has to be activated, has to have its protein accumulated before it can have the effect of causing gene two, the green gene, uh, to transcribe and translate and then eventually cause the accumulation of green protein. But when we're looking at a network graph, sometimes those types of interactions are stripped out and we would say that information is then found in some aspect of our graph annotation. But anyway, I hope that helps a little bit. We'll then move on in just a, a bit to talk about epistasis. What happens if we have a mutation? in gene one. How does that affect our ability to assess the activity of gene two or vice versa? Thank you for your attention.